the road that they're going to realize at some point they're not going to be able to cheat enough to steal the election. And if they come to that realization that they're not able to cheat enough, then you'll get some type of false flag. They'll kick the table over. Uh, a perfect example was, I think, yesterday they announced there will be no uh, national elections in Ukraine this year because of the war. And I mean, I could easily see that uh, happen in the United States for whatever type of false flag they come up with. But they do understand if Trump gets back in and it, and we do have a, a Republican Congress and Republican Senate, the amount of, ar- of arrests and people going to prison will be unprecedented. What happens if the sitting president dies of old age before the election? <laughs> Oh wow! I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It was just a thought that crossed my mind when you met, well, when you talked about that. It was like that'd be a natural event that would push things out. We don't even need an external or a, a black swan event to push that uh, push us uh, in that uh, that direction. Well, I mean, what, I know, just thinking out loud here. Is, maybe I shouldn't, but uh, well, this, I'm just what curious asking, what the scenario what is like. <laughs> what you're asking is whether or not we would follow the Constitution. I mean, under Following the Constitution, Kamala Harris would be president until January 20th or whatever it is uh, next year. And we would have the election and the results of, of the election. Whoever was elected president would become president January 20th of next year. That's what the Constitution says. What they would do, how it would play out, your guess is as good as mine. Okay. Because no, we don't have to go that way. Not followed. <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly. I've just uh, been watching way too much uh, social media footage on on certain uh, events here. Um, one, one last thing on the Fed and the potential rate cut. I'm curious because we talked about you know the decay of the dollar. I'm curious if a Fed rate cut is the beginning of of the end. Is that uh, would that be sort of the Damocles sword that's sort of hanging over the U.S. dollar as soon as the Fed starts cutting, the U.S. dollar is done. Is that uh, maybe too extreme, or is that something you would agree with? Uh, if the let's say in the March meeting between now and, and the meeting, they decide we're going to cut rates. I don't think they will, but uh, they decide that they're going to cut rates. You would then see weakness begin in the dollar. And I think that would pretty much push the boat from shore and it would be all downhill from there. Uh, I, I think it's imp- you got to keep in mind if they cut rates, you got to wonder, you, you need to know why did they cut rates? What were there any events ahead of time that it forced them to cut rates. Absolutely. Okay. No, that makes sense. And uh, we, we really can't predict those because the data is definitely not pointing at a rate cut right now. So at least not the next two sessions. So um, Bill, you're, you're precious, max, precious metals expert, of course, uh, you know, uh, writer and of course, broker about it as well. So I'm curious, the role of gold, has it changed at all? And do, I think we need to talk about the recent price move above $2,000 and uh, the new floor that's been established. Uh, I, I don't think, uh, Gold has a new role. I think the the role of, of gold is money and everything else is credit. I mean, J.P. Morgan said testified close to those words in Congress. The reason you want to own gold or the reason you want to own silver is because they cannot default. And what we talked about earlier, the world being or the, the literally the whole world, but led by the U.S. Uh, is hyper indebted. And we are, we're, we're moving into the phase, and you're already starting to see it, we're moving into the default phase. And that's why you want to own gold. That's why you want to own silver. Because in a world that is defaulting around you, gold nor silver can default. And it goes back to Richard Russell uh, for years and years and years said that when this thing go, when it finally blows up and goes down, the one who loses the least will be the winner. There's not going to be any outright winners that that that, that profit from the collapse, uh, but there will be those that have uh, gold and silver. They will have capital when the system reboots, when the the bulk, the majority, especially if you agree with the great taking, which I do, uh, because I do believe that that's the plan is to basically take take your assets. Um, if you have capital when this thing reboots. Your, your, your family will have wealth for generations upon generations. Yeah, hold on, just switching here. There we go. Bring him up back on the screen here. That, that, that's interesting, like Bill. Like 
we, we need to talk about uh, U.S. dollar and gold as well. Um, gold's value will increase. I think we're we're certain about that. The question is by how much, and uh, will it buy us more, or will it remain at the same level because the U.S. dollar is just so much worse? I think that's a question I want to discuss with you as well. Um, I think that's an easy one because there is all kinds of leverage in the gold and silver markets, but that leverage is to the short side. And there's leverage, obviously, in the stock market, the bond market that's on the long side. In other words, borrowed money is, has been and is being used to prop up stocks, prop up bonds, but it's also being used to suppress the price of gold and silver. And it's done via uh, naked uh, futures contracts on both uh, COMEX and the LBMA. So what that does is that increases the supply, if you will, but it's supply of paper metal. It's not real metal itself. Once, once credit breaks, that's when, or once credit is, is much more difficult to get, that's when you're going to see uh, asset prices declining in vast swaths because the debt has been pulled on the gold and silver side, the way to close that trade, they're going to be forced to buy, not sell, because they've already sold. So uh, the suppression scheme has been done with with naked naked short contracts. Gotcha. gotcha. It's like, Bill, one last question on, on, on the gold topic. And uh, it's something that's puzzling me a little bit based on everything we've discussed right now. Why aren't the generalists, or general investors buying gold right now? I'm just looking at the latest gold report from the World Gold Council. We're still seeing outflows, in particular in North America, from the ETFs. Yes, it's paper gold. I get it. But uh, bullion is a bit different. Um, but still, there's outflows. Even the bullion trade has been uh, decreasing. I think the bullion sales have been decreasing. The question is, why, why is that? Based on everything we've just discussed over the last 36 and a half minutes. Well, the, the first part of your question was about the generalists. Uh, generalists basically chase trends. And what we just discussed, I mean, they've suppressed gold, they've suppressed price, they've suppressed the miners. So you're not going to have the generalists follow that because the price action has been horrible. They've painted the picture. So the generalists, what are they buying? They're buying the Magnificent Seven. Um, as far as uh, metal flowing out of North America, that's an easy one. All you have to do is look at the premium in Shanghai for gold of $50, and there's a premium uh, north of $2 for silver on the Shanghai exchange versus the COMEX and the LBMA. So you've got natural uh, arbitrage that's buying gold in the West, buying silver in the West, and selling it and in Shanghai selling it in the East. So you've got, and they're, they're locking profit in on every single trade. It's a, it's automatic profit. Um, as long as it gets delivered, it's insured and, and you get paid on the other end, you've locked in a profit. So that's, you're watching metal flow from West to East. Gotcha. Um, where are you investing right now? Last question. If, if you were, now, if I were to come to you today with a hundred thousand dollars, say, Bill, can you invest this for me? How would you do it? And again, given this is not investment advice, this is just a rather like a more of a general question. Like, where do you see the trends? Where would you put your money right now? Well, I view the world as defaulting. The, the entire global financial structure is in the process of defaulting. So I think it's a no-brainer. You just buy physical gold. You buy physical silver. And you will have something when the smoke clears. Um, it, if it were someone who had debt, then you've got to think, well, do, would I rather pay my debt down or would I rather hold uh, gold or silver? I personally do still have some debt um, at very low interest rates, and that's why I've not paid it off. But I have gold, I have silver uh, that could easily pay that off. And why would I want to give up ounces now to pay off a, you know, three and a half percent loan or a four percent loan when you could see metals within a short period of time? Once this thing blows up, you could see metals double, triple, 
Uh, I mean, you, you could see 10 baggers. So, you know, why use ounces at current prices, which are suppressed, when if there is a system to pay the debt down, I'll be able to do it. And if there's not a system to pay the debt down, once there is a system reboot and the foreclosures begin, um, you know, then I'll use the gold and silver. And one piece of advice, if you do have debt, uh, I'm a proponent of being at least uh, six months, preferably a year ahead on the monthly payments, because when this goes down, that puts you at the back of the line for repossessions, foreclosures, etc. That'll give you time to be able to, to liquidate gold, liquidate silver, or what have you uh, to pay your debt off.